I have a rule about being constructive, so I can't ask any questions right now because all of the questions that I have right now are rhetorical and they end with the word idiot. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It is... Episode 373, apparently. It is uh, the middle of May of 2024. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things to not talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. It's nice to see you in person the other day. First time seeing you in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, we, we speak almost every day through messages. But uh, yeah, it's nice to, uh, we took in a lovely Orioles game um, on Mother's Day. <laughs> My mother was not in attendance and, uh, and then it rained and they lost, but it was still, it was still just nice to uh, hang out in person once in a while. IRL, as the kids said about 15 years ago. There you go. Uh, pro wrestling, meanwhile, marches on. There is no off season. In this great sport. The wonderful thing about the World Wrestling Federation, I've been told. Yeah, and so WWE is building to their pay-per-view with some Memorial Day weekend. AEW is building to their pay-per-view with some Memorial Day weekend. And if you live in the real world and wanted to enjoy your Memorial Day weekend, too bad! <laughs> because there's content Saturday and there's content Sunday. And there's content Friday, and there's content Monday. Unreal. Absolutely unreal. Anyway, WWE is doing their King and Queen of the Ring tournaments. Uh, what do you think of TV? Um, I think it's been pretty okay. Like, I think it's been pretty solid. It's a lot of wrestling, and that's good. It makes for a easy-to-watch show. I don't think anyone's winning awards for... You know, the work, there's nothing in there that's been like earth shatteringly great. Gunther and Sheamus had a fun TV match a couple of weeks ago. But um, yeah, overall, just simple, easy to watch television wrestling matches with something on the line, at least theoretically. Um, yeah, I think it's been it's been solid. At least at least the tournament stuff is uh, is working for me. The rest of the matches that will fill out this card not so much but that's not necessarily because anyone involved is doing something bad it's just not uh the the matches on paper don't really light my world on fire so far the half of the semifinals are set in uh both the king and the queen of the ring tournaments gunther and jay uso will wrestle on raw on monday with the winner advancing to the finals and then either uh randy orton or, Car- or carmelo hayes will wrestle la knight or tamatonga in the smackdown semifinals um those two quarterfinal matches are on smackdown this week and then over in the queen of the ring bracket it's eo sky and lyra valkyria in the Raw semifinals, and then the SmackDown semifinals will feature some combination of Nijax, Jade Cargill, or Tiffany Stratton and Bianca Belair. Tiffany got herself into some trouble this week. Mm-hmm. She uh, posted a, a clip on uh, one of her social medias of um, someone using a derogatory. It was a. It's an audio clip from some movie or television show that someone had put over. A video clip had edited over a video clip of Tiffany knocking Jay Cardgill off the apron in a tag match. Mm-hmm. And it used a derogatory term to refer to Jay Cardgill. And somebody is like, How could you possibly have done this by accident? And yet, I think it's hard to imagine a situation where someone would have done that on purpose. Someone would have been so dense as to do that on purpose. Either way, uh, I think Tiffany went from favorite 
to uh, underdog in her match against Bianca here on SmackDown <laughs> this week due to an oopsie on uh, on social media. Yeah, I it's I I have no <laughs> I have no official comment at this time on the Instagram thing other than yeah, it was stupid. Like you should pay attention to what you're doing. And if that's the excuse is you just saw the clip and posted it to your story or whatever, you should probably watch it and with the sound on, <laughs> you know, before you before you post. It's pretty stupid to do that. But uh yeah, you would like to think it wasn't a horrifically malicious thing she was doing <laughs> well there's the undercurrent here is that uh tiffy is apparently a uh a mega person as uh oh no <laughs> a pro I, wrestler who likes donald trump oh my I, gosh yeah uh it's always a little bit jarring when you uh encounter someone in the real world who um has very problematic opinions uh, these are people that fall down for a living, um, fall on their backs for a living, and uh, probably get a lot of head trauma, and uh, are paid to uh, paid to work out. Um, and I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I <laughs> they're not smart people. They live. They all live in Florida. <laughs> they all get, as you said, they all fall down for a living. She was trained by Greg Gagne. <laughs> There's a lot working against her being a smart person, but anyway, uh, whatever. It's it's she is. Well. <laughs> She's a grow- European boyfriend. You would think that she would accidentally become a liberal because of that. Um, well, he's quite uh, Aryan. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> Isn't he? Oh, oh no! <laughs> anyway, oh, let's no. not let's not cast any further. Uh, oh no! In that field, but anyway. I'll just say there's plenty of that uh, mindset in parts of Europe as well uh, currently. But anyway, to the back to the point. Yes, I don't think she's going to win this tournament now. But based on the fact that she and Naya were paired up against Jade and Bianca, who are the tag champs, you'd think either Jade or Bianca needs to lose to one of them to set up a tag title match maybe afterwards. Uh, once the tournament is over, but also Triple H really hasn't shown much uh, interest in booking the tag champs any stronger than Vince did. So maybe it'll be Jade and Bianca in the finals against each other. Um, I think on the bracket, based on the bracket, that's impossible. Or semifinals, I should say. Right. There's a on side, so it would be correct. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think Jade beating uh, Bianca makes sense there. Um, unfortunately, I think that makes the most sense. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I have a dog in this fight, but, um, regardless. No, you famously have no strong opinions about women's wrestling. No, no, I don't. Uh, I mean that the Raw semifinal with EO Sky and Lyra of Valkyria, pretty, pretty awesome. And, uh, Lyra's great. Unfortunately, she suffers from the wrestling thing that uh, um, Claudio Castagnoli used to, where she doesn't wear knee pads. Mm. And uh, whenever I see a wrestler that doesn't wear knee pads, they look nude to me. (laughs) And uh, that's just perverse. And frankly, I need my wrestlers to wear knee pads. Yeah. Or, you know, long tights or something. Dragunov maybe is the only guy I think that can get away with it. Okay. He doesn't. He doesn't wear knee pads. Yeah. But for some reason, it doesn't look. He just looks nude all the time anyway. Like even when he's wearing a full three piece suit. Right. Uh, Dragonoff looks nude to me. Plus, what? he's a he's a weird little freak rat boy. You know, he's a sure. He's he he's meant to look animal. He looks like a weird animal every time he's uh, he's out there. Yeah, your words not mine, but yes, yeah. uh, he is. Uh, yeah, but he just looks nude constantly. Uh, <laughs> but other than him. Yeah, everyone else I think needs to wear knee pads. Uh, yeah, so that's what's going on with the uh, King and Queen of the Ring <laughs> tournaments. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and the other matches announced so far for the King and Queen of the Ring PLE are Sami Zayn defending the Intercontinental Championship against Chad Gable and Bronson Reed in a three-way. 
Becky Lynch versus Liv Morgan. I wanted to shout this out just because it gave me one of the few things in life that brings me any joy <laughs> on on Raw this week, and it was Becky Lynch saying the word bitch. <laughs> it's just, I don't know how to explain it other than it it pushes a button for me <laughs> that brings me joy. I, I don't, it's nothing, I don't, I, it, I can't explain it. It's fair. I always, this is, this I, is a years, this is a years long. Um, I don't, I hesitate to say fetish <laughs> because, <laughs> because I'm not getting that kind of pleasure out of it. Okay. But, but this is a years long, uh, joy of my Becky Lynch saying, bitch, because she winds up. And she has a lot of M's and B's before. The, it's just great. Anyway, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> I appreciate you uh, clarifying the type of pleasure you're receiving from uh, from this segment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's fun. I, I have enjoyed Becky. Um, I have a question. Sure. Uh, is Liv good at anything? Whoa. You're ready to have this conversation, huh? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Because I feel like the <laughs> attitude is that she's very well liked by her peers. Yes. Um, you could probably argue there were times where she was more over with live audiences than she should have been based on her positioning on the show. Absolutely. But I just, whatever she is doing right now, I don't think any of it's good. I don't think any of her matches have been good. I think her promos are not good. I think any segment where she has to speak is not good. Uh, I just don't, I just don't care for, (laughs) I just don't care for anything that she's doing, which I feel, I feel a little harsh saying, because again, sure. By all accounts, lovely person, works very hard. One of those people that's sweating it out in 95 degree Tampa heat in with Natty and TJ Wilson every week and all that. But just just don't really see another another one for the category of people who looked like they could end up being like really, really good pro wrestlers that never got any better for me. And in some ways, like in her speak, the more she has had to speak for herself in her career, uh, the less good I have thought she is. Well, that's harsh, but um, I'm not going to be an, a, a Liv Morgan apologist. This is not my hill to die on. I don't <laughs> think, I don't think, uh, I don't think she got as good as she could have gotten. Um, there was a time I don't know, maybe eighteen months ago, where uh, she was working in the in the new dungeon mm-hmm. with uh, Natty and TJ, and was doing some more athletic things, and she added like that weird sunset bomb out of the corner, and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I look, I feel like a large there's a large portion of the, her fan base that uh, don't have pure intentions. Mm-hmm. And that's a big part of her being over. And now she's also kind of a heel who never really officially turned heel. Yes. Um, which adds to some of the confusion. Her promos are uh, vacillate between um, uh, not memorable and uh, batshit insane. Mm-hmm. And uh, the in ring isn't there so i'm not gonna argue uh for her i don't think i feel as strongly about it as you do but uh uh i don't think either of us are going to be invited to the live morgan cookout it's the... <laughs> no and you know i'm sure she and Bo make a delightful <laughs> Bo's out there working the grill i'm sure it's lovely lovely people yeah, sure don't put in the newspaper that i said she wasn't a nice person i just no, uh, of course not Smoke Just, a little smoke and uh, fire up the grill. You know? Yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, no, I just don't, don't, en- I just don't enjoy. And I don't, I don't, I don't think this, 
look, she was off for a long time. Maybe there's some ring rust. It's not like she's getting to work 20 minute matches every week on TV to freshen up. So like, again, it's a lot of it is the environment she's in too, but uh, yeah, it's just not, not clicking, but Hey, maybe they'll do a more overt villainous turn with her soon or, or whatever, if she's going to win the belt from Becky, who knows, but I don't know. It's just, She's not working. I just don't think it's working particularly well. And I don't feel like she is even as good a performer as she was like two years ago when she cashed in money in the bank and and won the title that way. The other match set here for King and Queen of the Ring is Cody Rhodes versus Logan Paul in a champion versus champion match where it remains unclear which championships, if any, will be on the line? Mm-hmm. What are we? What do we do? like as a match? Sure. Um. It turns out having your uh your champion finish a story, and then immediately go into months of not having any opponents, <laughs> isn't really good booking. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think we have once again discovered flaws in Paul Levesque's <laughs> ability to book anything besides a chase uh, and for, uh, for a babyface to do. So once they win, did not have the foresight, despite the fact that we on this show, I know Paul listens every week, which is a surprise because of how mean I am to him all the time. But I know he listens every week. We gave him some ideas for, you know, things you could have set up using the WrestleMania card. Yeah. And he chose to go in another direction. And yeah. Uh, yeah, they just had no challengers left for him. So, hey. Yeah, you can, I mean, yeah, you can do Cody and, and Logan Ball. And that is honestly probably a match they should do. I would have maybe waited for it to be in a place where it would make more sense to do it and maybe build some kind of issue for them as opposed to just kind of announcing it. But yeah, I mean, it's fine that they're doing it, but yeah, I guess you, you could do it. You could do the classic, like the one guy's belt is on the line the first time. So he wins to retain. And then you do a rematch for the other guy's belt and that guy wins. And then you do a rubber match or whatever, if you wanted or you could just do it non title because it's a Saudi show and you've already got their money, don't you? Yeah, there is that element to it for sure. Well, that is, uh, uh, that's the in ring with WWE. Um, the company has uh, filed something similar to a legal filing that Vince McMahon made in uh, trying to compel. Uh, Janelle Grant to participate in arbitration regarding a settlement with Vince and a settlement with the company who are being sued by her. Um, It is not surprising from a legal perspective that they would want to settle and get this over as quickly as possible because Mm -hmm. that's what that's what corporations do. Mm hmm. On the other hand, the optics of filing something pro Vince McMahon or pro settlement in this case is uh, the optics are bad. Yeah, it's, it sucks. <laughs> like you're right that it is the same thing any any company that would get listed in this sort of lawsuit would do, which is what's the quickest way we could clean this up without any more. Uh, you know, anything else going on a public record of any kind, any any specific details, any more names being mentioned, um, any test, you know, testimony being given in a court of law would probably not paint at least some of the folks who are still in the company in a in a good light. So yeah, of course they wanna they wanna move to cover their cover their own asses on this. But yeah, it's it's gross. It sucks. But that's that's now a a united a united front, so to speak, between the company Vince and uh, and Johnny Ace, all moving to compel arbitration.
Uh, there's also a New York Post article this week um, from Vince McMahon's crack PR team uh, that was trying to. I don't. I don't know how to describe this article. I don't like being on this beat. It was Vince's PR team trying to discredit Janelle Grant's claims by saying that they had proof that she had asked for Vince McMahon to be rough with her and she had asked for other things from Vince. And then they said they had text messages to prove it and then they refused to. They did not. They said they deleted the text messages without providing uh, any evidence of them. Correct. Absolutely bizarre. Correct. No, no, we're not able to provide screenshots nor any sort of verbatim transcripts uh, because uh, Vince deleted all of them uh, when when the relationship was ended. So um, always very telling who is willing to print a story like that and what kind of headline they give it. So New York Post. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really it was really gross and scummy, but that's. That's what's there. And I think there was, a, this might be going back to the arbitration thing, but there was another quote from Vince's attorney about how, like, if this goes to trial, the defendant reserves his right to establish other trails of evidence that prove his case or something. So in, I guess the, the, his legal team saying that they have more should, should this go to a trial and not to arbitration. So it's going to continue to be, extremely uh extremely ugly and uh yeah just a lot of terrible people involved here aew is building towards double or nothing on memorial day weekend traditionally one of their biggest shows of the year and they have uh six matches set up for the show so far and uh, the build for this is not lighting my world on fire. It's not lighting the world of those who would normally watch Dynamite live uh, on fire or even live plus same, same day viewers. Um, and so Dynamite was under 700,000 viewers on average this week. Mm-hmm. You know, I haven't seen the quarter hours yet for this week, but watching the show last week, as there was a long, like two or three segment rated our superstar Adam Copeland match in the main event of Dynamite, and I was like, you know what? By the end of this show, they're going to fall under 600. And they didn't, but it was like 625 or something. I'm guessing that they did fall under about 600 this week if the uh, average was just under 700 because usually the pattern is they start high, they drop throughout the first hour, they pick back up at the top of the second hour, and then it's just free fall in the last three quarter hours. So I'm mm -hmm. assuming that's, again, the pattern here. But uh, this double or nothing build, I don't know, man. Dynamite two weeks ago felt like a cold show to me. Mm -hmm. I thought this week's show was better. Maybe. Agreed. Uh, but I wouldn't say they feel like a red hot promotion. Mm -hmm. They're doing a lot of things I don't I can't stand. <laughs> uh, anything that involves the Young Bucks not wrestling in a wrestling ring, I can't stand. Um, and uh, La Adam Copeland's all over these shows. Swerve Strickland is made to look like a, a dork and gets laid out every week. And, um, yeah, Will Ospreay is wrestling for, like, the the number three singles championship. Uh, but, uh, hey, Mercedes Monet is uh, going to make her in-ring debut on the show, challenging for the title as, apparently, a heel. Because uh, Willow Nightingale is extraordinarily popular, and Mercedes is a natural heel. Anything uh, jumping out at you about anything that I've just gone on and on and about, including... <laughs> Whether AEW is hot or not right now, how you felt about the build to this pay-per-view and uh, the pay-per-view itself. 
I mean, I don't know how you could argue they were hot if you if you wanted to, uh, <laughs> you know, like it's. Uh, I mean, they've had some decent houses at, at some of these Canadian shows they've had over the last couple of weeks. Um, so it's not it's not the abysmal crowds they had maybe in in March of this year. But uh, yeah, it's I it doesn't feel like a hot promotion right now. There's things on the show that feel like maybe they're in the beginning stages of working but it is a slow process, especially when you are not a when you have been going through a period where your popularity has dropped a lot and people are not invested in your show to try to get people to reinvest is incredibly hard, even if you're doing everything right. And I would argue they're not doing everything right. See also the long Adam Copeland match that is on every show. Uh yeah, like I said, I, I think the the top program between the elite and the and and team babyface is fine. You haven't really, I mean, Dax and Cash are the only guys really cutting promos for for team AEW so far. I guess I guess there was some stuff on Collision, um, but obviously Eddie Kingston got hurt at the New Japan show over the weekend. He's now out. Darby Allen's now in. So you got one more show. You could have those four guys in the ring together, given a big rah-rah speech. But I also just keep going back to the Young Bucks and the Elite within the confines of the fictional show have not changed the show enough to where it feels like it's time for all, for like the baby faces to band together to fight them. Uh, because it's kind of just the normal show, but like maybe maybe the Bucks come out twice a show now. So I don't I don't feel like it's it doesn't feel like they've taken over the whole promotion. Other than that, the opening video package is just clips of the elite now, and they're you know they they did the bit where they fired they fired Christopher Daniels and who hasn't been on TV in two years anyway, and. And whatever they did, the brawl in the main event. Like nothing, I don't think anything they're doing is awful, but it's not great. You mentioned the swerve thing. I thought the angle they did this week was actually pretty good and pretty effective and felt pretty intense. But it is coming off the back of, as you mentioned, two other weeks where swerve was made, was laid out and beat up and left laying. So, uh, it, I don't know that again, there's nothing wrong with any of the that in in theory of trying to heat up a heel challenger that nobody thinks is going to beat the baby face. So you have him lay out the baby face every single week on the lead up. I get it, but it really it just it just screams backlash. It just screams mid, you know, mid not important pay-per-view title challenger who nobody thinks is going to win. Uh, when you just have Christian beat him up and like leave him laying every week. So like I said, I don't think everything they're doing is awful. I just don't think any of it's great. And when you add in the fact that it's just not a particularly hot property as a whole, uh, you see the results of that, which is just, it's not a, it's not a particularly engaging show. And there's also a lot of matches that are, which is not a new thing for dynamite, but it's a lot of matches. There's a lot of, John Moxley and Brian Danielson wrestled on that show, but they're wrestling Kyle Fletcher and Jeff Cobb or, you know, Swerve wrestled on the show, but he wrestled Brian Cage <laughs> because of the bottleneck of people who refuse to do jobs in this company. You have, you always have a star wrestling, a guy that nobody thinks is going to beat them in a, in a two to three segment match. And no matter how good the match is, I can see someone looking at that going, okay, it's Moxley versus Kyle Fletcher or whatever, a tag match. Oh, there's NBA and NHL playoffs on. I'm going to watch that instead. Like, it's just not, it just doesn't feel like a show you you have to watch right now. Nothing feels exciting or or like something you can't see on any other wrestling show, I guess. So for their pay-per-view, they have set up Swerve defending the world title against Christian Cage. Talked about that. Tony Storm defending the women's world title against Serena Deeb. Here's what we know about Serena Deeb. Um, 
she is uh, a professor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She has a flag. She dresses like a wealthy unmarried aunt. <laughs> Check. And uh, that's about it. Taught yoga. Yep. Uh, overcame alcoholism. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, yeah. I mean, they've kind of. Tony's kind of a baby face now, so. Well, of course. <laughs> Which I mean, she should be anyway, probably based on how much TV time they've put into her and how entertaining she is. Like, it's fine. Again, ex- imagine, imagine what everything I just said about Christian, but about Serena. Except they don't even have Serena lay Tony out every week. She did lay her out once, I think, a couple of weeks ago, but. Yeah, Serena does not feel like a threat to uh, Tony's no. world championship in any way. Not at all. The backdrop is all of uh, Mariah May and which which woman between Tony and Mina Shirakawa, uh does she want to team with? <laughs> in a matter of speaking. In a matter of speaking. Roderick Strong defending the inter- international championship against Will Ospreay. Still feels like a step down from op for Osprey, mm-hmm. slumming it with Roddy's belt here. I and mean, people are kind of digging Roddy's promos here. Um, that's probably the best promos Roddy's ever cut in his life. The bar is low. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say when you when you ratchet it up from like a four to a six and a half, it's it's impressive, but it's still yeah. you know, yeah, still a D plus, you know, <laughs> right. Adam Copeland's going to wrestle Malachi Black in a barbed wire steel cage match for the TNT Championship on this show. Hmm. Hmm. Have they said the rules officially? No, I don't think so. Okay. It sure seems like a way for Malachi to lose the match without doing a job, right? Sure does. Which is, I mean, it's his hallmark. Right. I was going to say, until... (laughs) Until Malachi Black entered the company, they had never done a cage match with anything other than pin and submission rules. Right. And then suddenly they did that one on collision and halfway through the week, they started advertising it as escape the cage rules on accident. Just by accident. Yeah. yeah. They, they just miss They just misspoke when they said it was a regular cage match earlier. Um, and then they sent Will Washington out to be like, no, it was always this way. <laughs> we just forgot to say it. Vice President of Lore, Will Will Washington, came up to clarify that it was definitely always escape the cage. They didn't change it midweek because Aleister Black refused to lose. Right. Um, anyway. Nate, I, I would be more inclined or more interested in seeing this match if I wasn't seeing Adam Copeland absolutely work his balls off every week to have a two and a half star match. <laughs> And maybe that's even being generous with the star rating. He yeah. he's on he's on every show, working very hard and sweating to have the most barely competent pro wrestling <laughs> match you've ever seen. Yeah, he's. I will say, I did <laughs> I did genuinely like his match with Kyle O'Reilly because Kyle O'Reilly <laughs> figured out. That the way you do it is to make Adam don't make Adam Copeland run or do yeah. anything athletic. <laughs> you 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 put him in holds, mm-hmm. and you have him put you in holds, and you and you just do you just break you just chop the tree down and you put him <laughs> in different submissions, and then you do your high spots at the end and your near falls. A lot of. Go. A lot of squeezing, yeah, a, a lot of grimacing, right. and it helped that they were in Kyle's hometown. And I think he somehow managed to convince people that maybe he was going to win the belt from Adam, right, on this collision show at in, the, in Everett, Ontario, or wherever they were. Yeah, sure. Um, so good job, Kyle. You are the only person that's had a good match with Adam Copeland in like three years. Well, there, there you go. But yes. Your your larger point stands. He is having long matches that are not very good, and now he's going to have a long match that probably isn't very good, like inside a cage where they can't even have like the other House of Black guys run in theoretically. Although right. even in this company, I don't feel like the cage means you can't just have interference anyway. 
Sure, why not? Also, I think they have teleportation power, so they could just teleport inside the cage, I guess. Yeah, why not? It doesn't matter. It, like I said, the only the only draw of this will be if they announce its pinfall submission rules, then I will be mildly more interested in this just to see if they finally labored their way to convincing Mal Black to, uh, to lay down for once. Uh, Willow Nightingale defending against Mercedes Monet the TV in a TBS championship match. Um, uh, the anti uh, Mercedes crowd is driving me insane. <laughs> Brian Alvarez is driving me insane. <laughs> Look, uh, Willow's awesome. Willow's a great pro wrestler. Mm-hmm. Willow is a natural baby face. Willow should be the baby face in this feud. Mercedes is a natural heel. Mercedes is a better heel. Mercedes is a great heel. Problem is, eventually, she's so good at being a heel, she turns herself baby face by accident. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we're at that point yet. I think we may be at the point where she came in and people were excited to see her. And then she's done nothing for eight weeks. And it's almost time to wrestle. But I think people are tired of not seeing her wrestle for 10 weeks. It'll be 10 weeks Mm -hmm. between her debut and her first match. I I don't understand why they brought her in that way. That's what they did. And now she will be challenging Willow and she will be the heel. And I think that's fine. Yeah. And they, they have time to like make it more overt. Like it's not like she's, you know, ready to start insulting children in the front row just yet. But yeah, at some point, like what happened with Soraya or anybody else, like they were going, eventually it was going to look, especially if she's going to win the belt, which you would think she is. Yeah. uh, Fans were going to start looking at it as somebody came from outside. Somebody came from WWE, even though she went to New Japan first. Uh, they were going to look at it as this is a WWE person coming in and beating it. even and again it's not like Willow is a day one AEW wrestler either but she's been around longer and she's well liked and she's super likable so eventually this is going to happen I, I give them credit in the sense that I think they saw they saw that and it feels like this is actually kind of it's playing out how it was meant to play out <laughs> And not like oh they panicked and were like oh no she's getting booed we've got to we've got to shift what we're doing, but um yeah like it's that's that's definitely the direction it's gonna go I think that's maybe the part of it that I might find irksome is that there might be a percentage of wrestling punditry that doesn't realize that like yeah they know like they know the crowd wants to cheer Willow and boo her like that's why they're doing it this way <laughs> I don't think yes. it's an accident. <laughs> Yeah. And the other match announced so far for Double or Nothing is Anarchy in the Arena. We've touched on this a little bit already. It's Team Elite, which is the Young Bucks, Jack Perry, and Okada against Team AEW. Shouldn't we all be Team AEW? Which is uh, Brian Danielson, for some reason, uh, FTR, and Darby Allen subbing for an injured Eddie Kingston. Uh People seem to enjoy the first Anarchy in the Arena. It was absolutely um, uh, insane and a wild thing played for like eight minutes during it. And mm-hmm. that was wild. Um, I think just the big I'm over the concept. <laughs> I, don't need, I don't need to see it. I don't need to see guys brawling in the crowd. I don't need to see guys brawling in a stadium. I just I don't need to see it. I don't care. It's one of those things that happens so often in pro wrestling where it was genuinely like different and creative and something that hadn't been seen in wrestling, at least in a long time. I'm not going to say never because there's like those crazy Memphis brawls and WCW and WWF in the 90s would do crazy crowd brawling and hardcore stuff. So it's not like it was stuff nobody had ever done before, but not stuff that had been seen in U.S. wrestling in a very long time. So. Right. It was in it was it was definitely super memorable, as you mentioned, for all the reasons you mentioned. However, once you have that first one that's super memorable, 
it's hard then the next year when you go, okay, let's recreate that incredibly organic thing that nobody really knew how it was going to go. And then it just all kind of fell into place and created this super memorable fun match. Okay. Now let's like create that on purpose. It's almost impossible to do. And it always comes off like a photocopy of a photocopy. So good luck to everyone. A lot of talented people in this match. I'm sure they'll do some really creative, wacky stuff, but yeah, good luck on trying to, you know, replicate the feeling that 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 first one had in any way um aew also announced this week that they will be partnering with the city of arlington texas to run six shows um one is a ring of honor pay-per-view and five of them are are aew collision episodes uh, in Arlington, Texas, at the Esports Arena, um, it's a residency of sorts. Um, I don't understand this. I wonder if they are being paid by the city. I'm not sure to do this. I I don't understand any of this. Let's hope so. <laughs> right. I mean, otherwise, it's a weird place to do a residency. Right. And not. It's a big area. I mean, it, they call it the Metroplex or whatever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You get Arlington there, you get Dallas there, you get Fort Worth there, right there. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I, I don't understand. It. Anyway, it's a twenty. It's a twenty five hundred seat building apparently. So maybe they can sell it out five times or six times or whatever the number is. Uh, it's just odd. Yeah, I guess again, just because. I mean, short of. TNA running Universal Studios for all those years. Nobody's, I guess AEW did some tapings at Universal too, but um, like this just, this sort of thing hasn't happened in wrestling in a long time either, at least not with like a major touring promotion suddenly taking up <laughs> and having their, their wrestling, their Saturday wrestling show all taped in one place every week, um, but still done live. So, uh yeah that's different and interesting uh but yeah like like i said it's it it is kind of an odd place but like you said i guess it is kind of at the it's an epicenter of a of a of a largely populated area area so i'm sure they can fill up a 2500 seater fairly easily and on the plus side, you can have the same people can probably come to a lot of these shows. So just just like the impact zone back in the day. So uh, yeah, interesting. It's, it's just like I said, it's just not something that we've seen anyone do. I'm honestly kind of it got me thinking, how has Uncle Nick not gotten WWE a residency in Vegas at some point? Yeah, I could see it. I mean, you could see it at the sphere or mm-hmm. a place like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, as I mean, they you could do a solid residency, not even have it be connected to your television product in any way. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Just have a daily that, house show basically. <laughs> yeah, that, that's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, someone should get in, get in uncle next year. <laughs> about that Paul, Paul I know you're listening <laughs> tell Nick I've got a great idea <laughs> Paul listens even though you called him famously a weak hearted bitch correct something <laughs> I stand by and Paul respects my honesty <laughs> as an honest man himself sure sure well what else do we have to discuss here that might be uh new japan has uh best of the super juniors ongoing and they have dominion coming up next month and john moxley looks like he's going to be dropping the world title to evil next month that sounds great companies completely lost their way absolutely totally completely lost their way it's like at least ren narita is like a guy you haven't tried to push you know, maybe he would like unlock something and 
you know, could be a guy that you tr- you try a new guy there. It's like, let's, no, let's let's go to evil. Let's let's go back to uh, the guy who ruined. It's not fair to say he ruined the company. He was just doing what he was asked. But a guy who had a lot of bad matches in COVID era in New Japan. Yeah. Yeah, they I mean, they've been pushing. The House of Torture faction all year mm-hmm. and uh, look, I I don't know. They it, it, I, I, I just I, I don't know. It's bad. <laughs> it's bad. Not a lot. Not a lot of reasons to tune into New Japan Pro Wrestling right now. Um, so there's that uh, AEW has a new YouTube show meal in a match. Renee Paquette, RJ City. They will. It's the old dinner in a movie from uh, the TBS TNT shows uh, uh, network uh, 30 years ago. And uh, yeah, there you go. So. um, Someone else gets to do a a program with Renee Paquette and I don't. (laughs) Well, it's it's like more. As we've talked about, RJ City, really good at YouTube content. Hopelessly awkward when they throw them out there on pay-per-views and stuff. So uh, more more RJ and Renee interacting on uh, on YouTube will probably be fun if you are looking for even more wrestling content to uh, to watch in your day-to-day life. Yeah, I'm not sure who is, but uh, there we go. Uh, I had a day off this past Sunday for Mother's Day. Uh, it wasn't specifically from Mother's Day, but anyway. And I went to a, uh, a baseball game. As we mentioned, we saw each other in person at a baseball game uh, on Mother's Day that uh, our mother wasn't at. <laughs> and uh, then I went to a wrestling musical. The last match musical was in town. It's uh, this musical starring, among others, Mickey James and former NXT and Impact interviewer Mackenzie Mitchell. And um, they came to a uh, 500 to 1,000 seater here in Baltimore, and they did a wrestling musical. And, um, you know, as wrestling musicals go, it was okay. Okay. Uh, um, some of the talent... It included the the aforementioned Mackenzie and Mickey, and also of uh, the former Bull James, Bull Dempsey from uh, NXT, mm-hmm. who appears to have been eating his feelings since he's <laughs> been released, and uh, Afa Junior, the former, I believe he's the former Manu from mm-hmm. uh, from WWE. Uh, also, look, WWE went out. And they're like, we need we need some own guys so bad. We're going to raid New Japan for the Gorillas of Destiny. Right. Okay. And this guy is a shoot. This guy, Alpha Jr., is a shoot cousin of Roman Reigns. And he's doing uh, musical theater uh, right now and not on WWE TV. So anyway, it was a unique experience. And um. Um and uh, uh yeah so uh, so is it if you don't mind my asking sure so is it is it more musical or more like indie show mm, more musical than indie show okay is there like full length matches or is it like they get in the ring and then start singing it's like they get in the ring and they start singing and then there is uh, uh like the number of actual bumps on this show. Less than five. Well, sure. I mean, Baltimore's a beat town. You don't want to be taking too many sure. bumps anyway. But yes, let, let alone in the musical. Sure. Yeah. So um trying to think of what else I could say about this musical that's positive. How, I try. How they, was the singing? <laughs> uh, all right. So <laughs> I, I'm not like the biggest musical buff. Sure. I've been to a, a a handful of them. I don't know. I've been married for uh, it'll be seven years this year, mm-hmm. and I have probably for my wife's birthday or for an anniversary or something. I've probably 
taken her to three musicals over the years, maybe. Okay. That sounds about right. So I've seen Waitress, and I've seen Hamilton, and I've seen... That might actually only be it. This might have been the third musical I've ever seen in my entire life. Okay. And I don't expect uh, Grammy-winning performances at, whenever I go to musical theater. Sure. I feel I feel like when you when you you can sing at that level, it's more important to like sing loudly and enunciate than it is to actually mm -hmm. be good at singing. And I feel like that's there's a certain uh, talent level that it, I, I don't expect good singers when I go to see musicals. I think what I'm saying. Sure. And as I was explaining this to uh, my wife as we went to the show, I was like, I'm not trying to compare what we just saw to Hamilton. Mm -hmm. However, because her point, my wife's point was, uh, the singing on the show was not very good. <laughs> and my answer to that was, uh, agreed, but I don't expect good singing when I go to see musicals. She's like, I think there's usually good singing in musicals. <laughs> and I said, well, maybe I just haven't seen a lot of musicals. So I, I don't know exactly how to how to answer that. Okay, that's fair. I mean, I think you're you're right in the sense that it's 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 certainly like just hitting the notes is certainly not the most important thing because you're there's choreography. You're as you said, you're trying to project your voice to, you know, to an arena full of people or an auditorium full of people like there's other things going on besides am I singing well? Am I hitting every note perfectly when you are performing in a musical? There are other skills being used at the same time as your singing voice at the very least. Right. So there is a, um, I, uh, I thought it would be a nice gesture to send one of the performers in the show flowers. And so I sent uh, Mackenzie Mitchell flowers. Uh, and, and I guess in discussing this with my wife, uh, she was like, well, normally if you send someone flowers, you know that person <laughs> and you don't know that person. Mm. So that was probably weird. But uh, Mackenzie liked the flowers and uh, posted photos with them and um, and uh, thanked me for them. So there we go. All right. Well, we learned a little lesson about theater etiquette, didn't we? Yeah. About who you uh, should and shouldn't send flowers to. Yeah, if you don't know somebody, you probably shouldn't send them flowers. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, there is the chance that they will enjoy that you sent them flowers. Sure. And thank you for that. And um, I forget what else I was going to say here. Uh, oh, we also learned you could just send flowers like you can send <laughs> flowers to a building and be like, hey, deliver this to the person in the musical and they'll do it. Huh. What do you know about that? That's interesting. <laughs> You'd think there'd be more steps. No, I was just like, hey, I would like these flowers delivered to this musical to the last match musical on, at the venue the day of the show and uh, uh it worked so what do you know about that also also good info to have what should you should the occasion arrive where one needs to send flowers yeah so zach Ryder is a producer on this uh musical whatever mm -hmm. that means and he, he uh, was in the uh the new york production of this i believe or uh last year i Yes, I know he spoke about it on on his uh, toy podcast with with Brian Myers. Yeah, he popped in for uh, a show on this current tour at some point. Uh, they were in like New York, or touring the uh, the Northeast and the Mid Atlantic, like New York, Philly, Baltimore, Virginia, North Carolina, the Crockett towns. Up... Yeah, exactly, and they finish up in Atlanta uh, at some point here. But um, the former Aiden English is uh, on this show, Matt uh, Rewalt, is on this show as playing like a Vince McMahon promoter character. Mm. Um, yeah, the show itself needs work. 
the show itself needs work. <laughs> it was it was priced at uh thirty dollars, I think, for general admission at forty dollars for a, for a chair. And uh, I think if it was priced one dollar higher, I wouldn't have gone. So there's sure. that. But uh making towns and making friends. Uh yeah. So I look forward to uh maybe doing a podcast with Mackenzie Mitchell. One day. Maybe maybe just now that the dialogue's been open, maybe inquire about her fondness for Frasier or any other number of 90s must-see TV sitcoms. Yep. Yep. Uh, who knows? There could be a collaboration there at some point. Yep. All right. Um, I think I've made this suitably awkward. <laughs> I realized that I did not uh, forget to, or that I forgot to bring up the uh, Brian Gortz deal. Oh, so, yes. So, uh, so the movie was promoting a documentary about the behind the scenes of WrestleMania 40 to premiere on Wednesday, April 10th mm-hmm. at like five or six p.m. or something like the normal time, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, it didn't come out, and everybody is speculating. Oh, there's a Paul Levesque cut and there's a Dwayne Johnson cut <laughs> and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, because this documentary has still not seen the light of day. So Brian Gorris did an interview with one of the, uh, the, the ringer podcasts, the ringers wrestling podcast sounds fucking dreadful by the way, but um, Gorris did an interview with it. And he's like, you know, this documentary is awesome. The Rock is not holding it hostage until he has approval of every frame. I think there was an error in terms of promoting it so soon because it wasn't ready to come out. There was an error that was made. Mm. This is a documentary that went from 11 minutes to 45 minutes, and now it's over an hour. It's pretty awesome. It will be coming out soon in some form, is my understanding. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dwayne, Dwayne is not holding this hostage. Which tells me Dwayne is holding us hostage. <laughs> and uh, it went from an 11 minute documentary to an over an hour long documentary. And uh, we're going on, let's see, 20, 36 days since it was supposed to be released and it is not out yet. And this is, as far as I can tell, this is the first time anyone, even tangentially related to the product or the company, has addressed this. Yes, I think there may have been an off the record at some point. Um, somebody asked WWE about it, and they and through like they off the record or on background said uh, it's delayed, but no explanation as to why it was delayed. Right, so this is the first uh, <laughs> Brian Court. Hey, The Rock's not holding this thing hostage. <laughs> Just like people, Brian. He, no one said that. I was gonna say he just picked specific <laughs> words that nobody had said about this. Like yes. people are like, well, maybe Rock wants to see the finished product before he sees it. Like people say, are or his people want to take a look at it and are you know or are want want to have their own edit. It's like okay, that's not quite the same as the Rock is holding it captive and combing over every frame. It's right. Like, oh, that's. That's significantly more uh, specific than anything anyone else had said. That's interesting, Brian. Yeah, no one said that, Brian. You said that. <laughs> um, I mean, when you pair this with the, it, I don't know if it, it, how common the common knowledge this is. I assume if I don't know who's paying attention to WWE.com, except people that need to use WWE.com for the work like I do. Mm. And after every show The Rock appears on, um, there are photo galleries up on the website of each segment, if not right after the segment, fairly quickly after the show. Right. Or it's like they're they're adding photo galleries to the website throughout the show or and, and maybe after the show, uh, they'll post the whole thing. But so it, if you go and you like check out the photos of from the red brand on the Monday, May 13th Raw. And you'll go at 1130 on Monday night or whatever. And there'll be a photo gallery with every segment from Raw. If The Rock is on the show, 
there are no photos of the rock posted until the next day, Mm -hmm. which tells you, okay, someone on the rocks team needs to to approve every photo of the rockets on the rocks that is on WWE.com, which first of all, who would, I mean, why would you need that level of control? (laughs) Right. Secondly, can you imagine the level of control? That Dwayne Dwayne has gone in here and he's thrown his nutsack around. That's what's happened, right? I mean, yes, <laughs> it's his company, right? He well, and Nick Khan are running the show now. Yeah, that's that's what this just feels like a microcosm of. But yeah, it's like imagine being Dwayne's photo guy too. What if you approve? Oh. What if you approve a photo and then it somehow gets back to him and he doesn't like it? Like, like you just. You're you're on the you're in the bottom of the river somewhere in <laughs> in Mississippi the following week. You're 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 at the bottom of his trout pond on his farm in Virginia. <laughs> he has a a pond on his farm in Virginia. You know he's a just a common man. He oh, has yeah. a a pickup truck. He drives a pickup truck, <laughs> and he has a farm uh, with a pond on it that he keeps stocked with fish so that he can go fishing in his farm. <laughs> Uh, it's just wonderful, you know. Just everybody who doesn't dream of having a <laughs> gotta fly in some fish. Yeah, Dwayne wants to fish. DJ wants to fish. Yeah, well, obviously, you just you fly in some some trout to his private pond, just <laughs> like any salt of the earth normal <laughs> guy would do. Um, and when he's done approving what photos of him can be on the website and. <laughs> And he gets and he gets Brian's notes on how the documentary is coming. Then he'll go out and he'll he'll start fishing. He's just America's best friend. He's great and he's normal. I think that's something everyone should just keep in mind. He's normal. Yeah, he's without normal question. A question. He uh, he urinates exactly <laughs> the same way and the same places that we all do. Yeah. No. And you know he he. He doesn't uh he's punctual obviously uh yeah and uh and if he isn't it's actually helping the crew that he isn't punctual so you know he's a he's salt of the earth guy i just i don't know where these rumors keep getting started yeah that he's holding the documentary (laughs) brian literally no one said that (laughs) boy brian (laughs) uh that guy that's he's like yeah look props to him for punching way above his weight class as far as the amount of success a wwe head writer could have in in real hollywood but he glommed onto the right guy yeah and again that is not a useless skill that is a it's a it's a certain skill set that he has that is uh makes him very uh employable to one man only <laughs> and uh good luck good luck to everybody yeah yeah hope everyone enjoys is there anything else you'd like to discuss no man i think we just we just leave it there we just leave it hanging there sure all right well till next time everybody i'm ethan <laughs> and i'm liam we'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life adios Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. You hate anything as much as Donald Trump hates his sons. I I don't know that anyone's ever hated anything. <laughs> Much as Donald Trump hates all of his children except for the one daughter that he wants to sleep with. Uh, yeah, that's. <laughs> There's a nugget in, I think it's whoever Don Jr.'s mom's book about how, like, Don, Don Trump was going to, like, use Don Jr. to, like, he was going to, like, hold him hostage. <laughs> try to manipulate her but after like a little bit of time when she didn't bite on it he just sent her back <laughs> sent him back to her because <laughs> like he didn't want to raise him either <laughs> huh. like 
people just people just no one seems to like that boy there's a story years ago too about him going to pick him up for college at his college dorm to take him to a yankees game or something and he <laughs> he gets there he says you look like shit he slaps him in the face and says come down when you're ready <laughs> You remember that one? No, I don't remember that one. Okay. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah, apparently he yeah, he went to pick him up at a at college, take him to a Yankees game, and he gets there. And he opens the door. He says something along the lines of "You look like shit. He slaps him across the face, and he says, "Come downstairs when you're done getting dressed or whatever." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's one way to communicate. At least you uh you know where you stand. Sure. Yeah. So. Look, at least they register. He's got, you know, you're not in like the Tiffany camp where right. he forgets that you exist completely. Right. Or the Baron camp where he appears to only be aware of his height and nothing else about the boy. Yes. So I guess there are levels to it, depending on the uh, the way you look at the, his relationship with his various uh, offspring. Hard to miss Baron. He's he's uh he's almost as tall as Satnam Singh now, I'm pretty sure. Yep. Yep. He's uh he's over six eight. I try to keep on keeping on.